Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Amiga Game Programming Series. In previous episode we were developing the code for rendering background tiles. It wasn't smooth sailing, the path took us through various debugging stages until we arrived at working solution. Today we'll start looking into sprites. I also used Promotion for drawing sprites. I won't show this in the video, but it also has great support for animations. So it didn't take me long to draw all the sprites for our main protagonist. Here you can see finished image with sprites for both directions, ready to be exported. As usual, we'll export as IFF image for simple consumption on the Amiga. And we'll again use Deluxe Paint to strip it to 16 colors. But we'll use GFX Master for exporting to RAW bitplanes this time. The process is quite similar to IFF Converter, but the user interface is a bit more streamlined. Once exported, we need to include RAW data into our program to make it visible to our code, as we did for tiles in previous episodes. Before going through actual code, let's take some time to familiarize ourselves with Amiga Sprite data format. Sprites have fixed width of 16 pixels, however they can be almost any height you want, starting at just one pixel or taller than screen. Each sprite can use three colors out of the palette of 16. However, two sprites can be attached to get access to all 16 colors. Palette entries for sprites use top 16 hardware color registers. This means that if we use 5 bitplanes for our playfields or dual playfield mode, then top 16 colors for playfields will be shared with sprites. Sprite data starts with two control words, in which we define sprite position on screen, height and control bits. The structure may be a bit confusing, but nothing to be scared of. Let's take a closer look. For each sprite we need to provide starting and ending vertical positions. This defines sprite height and must match the number of data words. Vertically, sprites can be positioned from 0 to 512. However, coordinate 0 is outside screen visible area. It's only at position of 44 that sprite becomes fully visible vertically. This allows smooth movement of sprites in and out of the screen. Let's get back to maximum value of 512. This means 9 bits are needed to describe the position, which brings slight complication in how the values are stored in control words. Low 8 bits of starting position are stored in high byte of control word 1, but 9th most significant bit is stored in bit 2 of second control word. Ending position is similarly split. Low 8 bits are stored in high byte of control word 2 and most significant bit in bit 1 of same control word. And similar for horizontal start position, which is allocated into low byte of control word 1, while 9th bit in bit 0 of control word 2. The only other data stored in control words is bit 7 of control word 2, which is 0 for normal sprites and 1 for attached sprites. Control words are followed by data words with which we specify color for each of the sprite's pixels. Each line requires two words. Amiga sprite hardware expects to have as many lines as defined by the difference between vertical end and start position in control words. For each pixel we have two bits, meaning we can select four different values for color. Amiga supports up to eight sprites, and as mentioned before, each sprite can have three colors. However, not just any three out of the palette. The exact colors depend on sprite hardware number as shown here. And lastly, we must have two additional words at the end of sprite data. 
These two words are interpreted the same way as sprites control words. They are used for sprite reuse, but in all other cases both values should be zero. Perhaps you were wondering why certain colors are marked unused. These color registers come to play when using attached sprites. In this case, two sprites are combined which gives us double the number of bits describing a color index. So that's 4 bits, meaning 16 colors as shown here. Sprites can be attached only in these combinations. Attachment is only valid when attached bit is set in data structure of odd sprite. So bit 7 of second control word of sprite 1, 3, 5 or 7. Other requirements for attachment to work is that both sprites are located on exactly the same position on screen and they share number of data words. So basically their control words must be identical apart from attachment bit which only needs to be set for second sprite. Right, so let's look at the code. First of all, with this episode we're introducing structures. Structure is a way to describe the data, what fields there are and how long there are. It's so simple in its making, you can check how it's implemented, it's just macros. So structure, it's a starting macro that creates an index and is then followed by data macros which define the size of each individual data. And each data increments the index that structure creates by the amount of bytes that the data represents. So uWord it would increment by 2, uLong by 4, byte by 1 and so on. And what happens is that it simply assigns the constant with this name that we specify to current index. So with structure we start with 0, so bit planes width becomes value of 0. And then the index is incremented by 2 because this is a word and so bit plane height becomes constant of value 2 and so on. So structures is really really nice way of handling the data and in a way it's similar to C structure or C++ structure or any higher level language structures. However it's not as sophisticated. In our code, we still need to know the exact length of each data and we need to use appropriate instructions. For example, if we move the data and the data is a word, we need to use move.w and if it's a byte, it's move.b and so on. In our case, we're defining a bit plane. Bit plane is the same bit plane as we discussed in previous episode when we were rendering background. And for each bit plane, we can specify its width and height. And then we have the pointer to the actual data, the raw data, and the number of bit planes. And then we calculate some helper variables that previously we used as constants. So the width in bytes for single bit plane, for all bit planes, and as well as the whole size. As you can see, I use some convention to prefix each field uh, by the name of the structure so it's easier to keep together and prevent some duplication because width and height can be also used in other structures. So in this case it's bit planes underscore width, bit planes underscore height and so on. And it's also convenient to end each structure with label. This will create a constant which is named bit plane size in this case and it will contain the actual size of the bit plane. So this is useful for uh, allocating memory and so on. So once we have a structure defined, we can create useful subroutines that deal with it. First example here is initialization subroutine. What it does is takes partially populated structure with only the requisite fields, which is width, height and number of bit planes and it calculates all the dependent data, the width of bit plane and so on. And the subroutine is quite simple as you can see. What we did with constants previously, here we are calculating in code with instructions. So we calculate bit planes width and then 
copy it to the bitplane structure and by using indirect addressing mode 80 points to the start of the structure so it points basically to this byte here and we can assign all the rest of the values i think the subroutine is quite clear as it is so i won't be explaining it in details but you can pause the video and take a look for yourself we require this subroutine to be called for each bit plane structure that we create because only afterwards it becomes useful for other subroutines. Next subroutine calculates the offset into bit plane data. So, for example, we want to extract only part of the data at exact given x and y coordinate. And again, the subroutine is very, very simple. I will just scan through it and you can pause the video and check the comments. I think it's quite self-explanatory. We will use this subroutine to calculate the offset when we will be copying the data for each individual sprite out of the bit planes. Next up is actual sprite handling routines. First of all, some constants. We want to define the left and top coordinate as well as right and bottom coordinate where the sprite is fully visible. So sprites can be rendered outside of screen visible area and the reason for this is to allow to animate sprites in, so to partially render them inside the screen and partially outside of the screen. So the coordinate where the sprite fully becomes visible horizontally is 64 and on top for to become fully visible vertically it's 44 and then for the right and bottom part it's just the simple calculation based on window width and height and then we have a structure for sprite each individual sprite will have its own structure and this structure will contain the x and y coordinates of the sprite sprite's height attributes and then bit plane x and y coordinates so this is the offset into the bit plane where the sprite data is contained then we have bit plane offset because sprites don't always start at bit plane zero some can start on bit plane two for example and then we have the pointer to actual bit plane so this is the pointer to bit plane structure where the data is to be copied from then we have sprite data and this is the pointer to chip memory data where sprite is defined so this is the data that is actually visible to hardware chips and here we have also a constant and this is for attached sprites and this is another macro bit def macro and what bit def macro does it creates two constants one is sprite in this case sprite b underscore attached and sprite f underscore attached sprite b attached has the value of seven in our case while sprite f attached has the value of one shifted left seven times and then similar to bit planes we also have helper subroutines for sprites first of all sprite init subroutine again similar to bit planes we only require certain fields to be pre-populated and we calculate the others the subroutine is again quite simple. We just get the bit plane offset, so the, the index of the bit plane, and then we multiply it by the width, which we previously calculated for bit planes. And here you see how we reuse the data and the code uh, by virtue of structures. So we don't have to recalculate the same thing that we had to calculate for bit planes here. And after we calculate it, we write it back to the sprite structure. Similar to sprite init, we have a different subroutine called sprite init attached. Uh, attached sprites have very similar configuration to normal sprites, but they are composed of two sprite structures. We could, of course, initialize both separately but the structures are almost exactly the same except the offset in the bit plane where the source data comes from and of course we need to set the attached flag so we can see the first we just simply initialize the first sprite 
and then we copy all the same values to the second structure and then we set up the unique values. And then we need to calculate the offset for attached sprite data. Other than that, when we are done, we simply need to initialize again this second structure for attached sprite and we are done. Right, let's continue with the rest of the helper subroutines for dealing with sprites. First of all, we need to update the copper list. And the copper list, if we look at it, here we have each and every of eight possible sprites defined. So we need to define the location in chip memory where the sprite data is found. So that's this data. And for each sprite separately. So we need to update the address in copper based on sprite data in the structure. And this is very simple. We use our good old friend of copper update address subroutine. The result will be that the sprite data will actually become available to hardware registers and will be able to be displayed. Next up is sprite update control words subroutine. What this subroutine does is it fills out these two control words, the first two words of sprite data. And this will actually define sprite X and Y coordinates as well as various flags. It needs to be called after coordinates change. So basically this will be used to move sprite around the screen. As convenience, when specifying sprite coordinates in structure, in sprite structure, we just use 0, 0 for top left of the screen. So we would actually need to use negative values to show sprite outside the screen. Therefore, we need to account for it. When we copy the value of Y, we need to add the top coordinate for screen as discussed previously. And here on the right, you can see the value after each of these calculations. So at this point, we have the actual coordinate as expected by Sprite hardware. We have it in the lower nine bits of D1 register. What we need, lower eight bits need to be uh, at the higher byte of the first control register. And then the extra, the ninth bit needs to be on third bit in the first byte. So a little bit complicated, but if you look up how Sprite uh, control words are set, it will make sense. Uh, how we achieve it, we simply roll the value left and we can only roll by eight bits at a time. So that's why we need to repeat it three times. You may wonder why using roll instead of logical shift left. Well, it's quite simple because with roll after we move to this the final, the third time, the extra bit will be rolled over as the name suggests to the first bit of the value. And after we are done with that, we just need to move this byte, just the lower byte by two bits left and we have it on the correct location. And when we have the D1 calculated, we just OR D1 into D0. And so D0 is now ready with vertical position. And we do exactly the same for the rest of the values, except we need to roll to a different place in the control words. And when we are done, our D0 register contains exactly the control words as needed by the Sprite hardware for Amiga. The only thing left is to copy these two words into the actual sprite data. And this is where we do it. And that's it. The last of the sprite subroutines is sprite copy data from bit planes. What this one does, it will copy the raw bit plane data into the data words of the sprite. So this will actually fill the sprite and make it visible on the screen. It's a little bit complicated because we need to use two offsets into the bit plane data. But I drew a table here, which I think it will explain how, how the data is stored. So let's take a look at it. For example, we have five sprites in a row. So 
for line zero, for first top line of bit plane zero, it has this data. First word is the word zero for sprite zero. So it's it's this this word here. Second word contain second sprites word zero. So it would be this second sprite, this word. And so on for third, fourth, and fifth sprite. And then for bit plane one, for still for line one, at this offset we have the word one for sprite zero. So that's this word. And followed by word one for second sprite, this word here, and so on. So this is just single line. For the second line, we need to move all the way here to get word two, which is this word, and so on. Basically, we have two offsets for each sprite. First, there's an offset for uh, left side of the words, so to speak, and then for right side of the words. So basically, we fill it out like this. This is bit plane zero, and this is in bit plane one. The code itself. First, we just set up the offsets to point to the start of the data in bit planes and as well as the start of the data for the actual sprite data. And then we enter the loop and we simply move both words and offset the address register so that source and destinations are correctly updated. And as you can see here is the same table and with A, B and C I specified what happens after each operation. So feel free to pause the video and take a look and I think it should be quite self-explanatory. This subroutine needs to be called whenever we want to show a different data for the same sprite. And for example this would be if you want to animate the sprite. Believe it or not, this couple subroutines is all we need to do sprite rendering as well as animations, moving and so on. Right, what remains is to see how we actually use these routines to get some sprite on the screen. And first we initialize the sprite's bit plane structure, we specify the width, the height, number of bit planes and then we initialize it. And afterwards we initialize the attached sprite. As mentioned previously we only need to do it for the first sprite and then sprite init attached will set up everything needed for second sprite. Okay, so let's check what this code does. And voila, here is our sprite. Let's position it to some location where it's visible a bit more. Let's try 160 and 140. And here, our sprite is now displayed in a different area. So this is how we would be updating the position of the sprite. Of course, as mentioned before, we only need to update the control words of the sprite, not to reinitialize the whole thing. And we can also try to show a different image. We will turn the sprite to the left side. And it is. And we can also try to use a different image, so let's use the fourth image. And there it is. We can also try it turned to the right side. And voila! Of course, the sprites needs to have their colors defined. And we can check that. First of all, in copper list, we have all 16 colors for sprites defined, but they are all set to zero. 
and in copper setup code we are actually copying all 16 colors of the sprite palette from the source which is after the bit planes data for sprites into the copper and this is the part where we do this we also set up all the sprites to null sprites so basically without setting any concrete sprite all of these pointers will just point to a null sprite and null sprite is just an empty sprite i went through the code quite quickly to keep the episode reasonably short and meaningful if that's not enough or you simply prefer to get ready-made code please consider becoming my patron one of the perks gives you access to full source code ready for building and running if interested See the link in the description below. And that's all for today. We only touched base with sprites. In future episodes, we'll further refine sprite handling so that actual data will be allocated automatically in chip memory. We'll also optimize our code to be much more efficient when swapping sprite data for animations. In the meantime, you can try implementing animations and sprite movement with this code as self-exercise. It's more than capable of smooth animations and movement even in current state. In the next episode, however, we'll look into moving our sprite around based on joystick input, as well as implement some form of physics. So, until next time, goodbye! <laughs>